Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian. Our guests today are T.J. Travis, Irene Moore Davis, Amina Abdul. In this episode, we're celebrating two of Windsor's earliest and most influential women writers, both of them women of African heritage who lived in Windsor in the 1850s, Mary Miles Bibb and Mary Ann Shad Carey. We are joined by T.J. and Amina and our own Irene Moore Davis. T.J. Travis is an Afro-Indigenous artist and activist, born and raised in Wawangtong, the last stop of the Underground Railroad. As an art practitioner, T.J. uses poetry, spoken word, and traditional hand drumming to spin a tapestry of narratives to breathe flesh and blood to the long-lost stories of his ancestors. In 2017, he launched his Missing from History, Women of the Underground Railroad Project to identify the important role women played in the intricate network of freedom fighters known as the Underground Railroad. He went on to develop these stories through poetry, spoken word, and theater. More recently, TJ's exploration of his family history led to a multidisciplinary project called Born Enslaved. He is a member of the founding board of the Windsor Youth Center, the founder of an arts-based community outreach initiative called the Bloomfield House, involved in many organizations, and currently the executive director of ArtSite, Inc. This year, in collaboration with Friends of the Court at Mackenzie Hall, TJ successfully advocated for the renaming of a city of Windsor Park in honor of 19th century writer, educator, and activist Mary E. Miles Bibb. And of course you're familiar with Irene Moore Davis. Irene is a Windsor-based educator, writer, historian, and podcaster, one of our All Right in Sin City co-hosts. Irene is also president of the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, program chair at Bookfest Windsor, and actively involved with many other community organizations. Irene has published works of poetry, short fiction, history, and journalism. Her forthcoming book is titled Our Own Two Hands, A History of Black Lives in Windsor from the 1700s Forward. She is a graduate of the University of Windsor, Western University, and Queen's University, and is an administrator at St. Clair College, where she also teaches English, Underground Railroad History, and Black Cultural Studies. Amina Abdul is a poet and teacher who's passionate about art and expression. Born in Somalia, Amina has been living in Canada since she was seven and is proud to call Windsor her home. Amina has been working as a teacher for the last 10 years. She's taught English at the high school level and is now the department head of ESL at Kennedy Collegiate. She's also the co-founder of Black Staff Equity Alliance, as well as a member of various organizations within the city that focus on equity and justice. Amina sits on the board of two organizations and tries to use her time and voice to support her community in whichever ways she can. Amina began writing fiction at a very young age and quickly fell in love with poetry and, and all forms of artistic expression. A graduate of the University of Windsor's creative writing program, Amina began to focus on writing works of poetry that touch on several issues, including her cultural background and issues of identity. Welcome, TJ, Irene, and Amina. Thank you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, our first question for TJ and Irene is, who was Mary Miles Bibb and what did she do in Sandwich in Windsor that makes her so memorable? Why should, why should we remember her? Uh, yeah, uh, Mary, Mary Miles, Mary Miles Bibb, born in, born in 1820, uh, Rhode Island, daughter of free black folks. And I, uh, and I, and I don't mention that all the time, but I mentioned it in this instance, because we're, we're talking about two very powerful people who also happen to be women that have ran this like amazing, uh, parallel in their, uh, their careers and their activism, her, uh, 
her parents were were of the uh, the, the Quaker faith, you know, and I and I, re, I reflect on the the Quaker faith and the how that had to have inspired, you know, uh, the the activism that that uh, that that came from Mary Boo. She uh, she studied at the uh, the Massachusetts State Normal School. She graduated in 1843, which is seven years before the passing of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. It seems like it seems like the, the stars were were aligned for for Mary Bibb in that you know she was she was born to free black parents and she had these opportunities to be educated and then she had uh, she had people that came into her life such as uh, Samuel J May who was who was for for women's rights and was like you know uh, you know part of like the uh, like 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 pushing for that the liberation of uh, of black folks. Mary Bibb, with her education, she became she became a teacher. She uh, she joined uh, she joined these these movements around the liberation of uh, of black folks. Where of course she would meet uh, Henry Bibb, who who she would marry, who was uh, who was who was born enslaved in in Kentucky, escaped a few times. You know, uh, became fair became quite quite famous around uh, around his. His narrative, but was still on the run. So you know, after they passed the Fugitive Slave Act of eighteen fifty, uh, Mary Bibb and her and her husband they they emigrated into into uh, Canada and settled in in Sandwich Town and then in Windsor and just did amazing did amazing work. You know, from uh, from the uh, establishing the voice of the the fugitive and creating a, a platform for black voices to communicate you know locally and and abroad the the refugee home uh irene you can, you can you can you can help me out with that one with the uh, refugee <laughs> home society you know which uh which was about like acquiring land and you know uh providing providing space for for uh building spaces of education, businesses, you know, like in, incredible, just incredible, incredible work, you know. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Henry Bibb died quite early in his life at 39. Uh, but I mean, she went on to become, an, she was an entrepreneur. She opened up a, a business. She was, she was a seamstress and an artist. And uh, she, I mean, we could just go on and on and on. So I'm going to, I'll pass the mic over to, to Irene to, uh, to fill in the blanks. Yeah, I mean, something that I've heard TJ say before, I mean, we always want to give honor, maximum maximum honor to Afua Cooper, who did her whole dissertation on the bibs and is like the number one expert in Canada on the bibs. But something I've heard TJ as a local expert say several times is that Mary Miles Bibb didn't have to do this work at all. She could have just lived comfortably as a teacher, stayed in the Northeastern US doing her thing, but she got involved in the movement and it really changed her life. And she, you know, rolled up her sleeves metaphorically and did all of this incredible work. So, I mean, a couple of other things I would mention about her. Um, when Henry, her husband, published his autobiography in 1849, The Narrative of the Life and Adventures of Henry Bibb, it was written at a, at a, you know, at a register that was very literary. And Henry Bibb was an impressive individual, without a doubt. But Henry Bibb had had sort of rudimentary education in his enslaved uh, days and went further and tried to learn more and improve his literacy skills later. But we definitely notice the difference in register, the difference in language and grammar and spelling and all of that stuff between his correspondence uh, when he was writing a letter to someone, um, which he did very often, or in his publications, like the things that he wrote in the Voice of the Fugitive newspaper or the things that he wrote in his autobiography. And, and many of us really detect Mary's fingerprints all over that work. The register, the tone, the language are a lot more like her writing in, in many cases. So that was a dream, you know, it was, it was a dream team. I've called them the black power couple of the Underground Railroad era on a number of occasions. And it's just incredible the work that they did together. But I mean, the other piece that I would say is, you know, a, a lot of times over the years, people have given maximum credit to Henry Bibb and he deserves a ton of credit. What he achieved in his short life is incredible. 
But I think in more recent years, the last uh, 20 years or so, for sure, people have, have started to really notice Mary Miles Bibb a lot more. And there are definite reasons for that. And I mean, yeah, she was not only this great writer, teacher, uh, settlement worker, activist, abolitionist, but she also opened up a dressmaking shop and she sold the latest Parisian fashions and she formed probably Windsor's first literary society. I don't know of one that existed prior to the one that she founded. And uh, she was just an incredible person. And we're so fortunate to have the history of this individual tied to this area. It's so fascinating to be able to, you know, draw so many lines, you know, back to, back to this, this, uh, this power couple, you know, what, uh, what attracted me so much to, to Mary Bibb was that she was so, she was, she was missing from history, you know, like Henry Bibb and deservingly so, you know, there's, there's so much accolades that, that are, that are directed toward him. You know, and I was so fascinated just knowing the uh, the background of Mary Bibb, and just just understanding that you know if she is like so high, highly educated and she comes from uh, free parents and this this Quaker faith, you know, we start to think about like seamstress and dressmaking, like these little things that she must have picked up along the way, right? And she had all these tools in her tool belt, you know, and it was such a great opportunity for like, like Henry Bibb to like, to really like ride, to ride that wave, you know, like myself in my life, I've, I'm nothing at all, if not for like the women that are around me, you know, just despite any acknowledgements that I get, you know, so when I think about that particular couple, I'm like, oh, she was, she brought so much to the table in that relationship, but just, you know, for all of us, just in general. So at this time, we're going to have Amina Abdul read a passage uh, that was written by Mary Miles Bibb. Thank you. Mary E. Bibb to Garrett Smith, 8 November, 1850. Sandwich, Canada West, November 8th, 1850. My dear friend, will you aid us by sending as many subscribers as convenience will permit? There are hundreds of slaves coming here daily. My husband and self consider this the field for us at present. He is about to engage in this. I expect to take a school next week. Any aid from a friend will be very acceptable. Please let me know what you think of the movement. In haste, M.E. Bibb. Prospectus Voice of the Fugitive in Canada is to be the title of a newspaper to be published by Mr. Henry Bibb at Sandwich, Canada West, near Detroit, Michigan. It is designed to be an organ through which the re refugees from Southern slavery may be heard in both America and Europe. The first copy will be issued in January 1851 on a medium-sized sheet and will be published but twice a month until we shall obtain a sufficient number of subscribers to support a weekly. To do this and spread out our cause widely before the world, we would most respectfully solicit all to whom they may come, and especially such as are interested in the elevation of those of us who, after many long years of unrecorded toil, have succeeded by the help of God in making our way to where we may glorify him with our bodies and spirits, which are his, to subscribe for the paper. And if any should wish to know whether fugitives can take care of themselves after becoming free from bondage, subscribe for the paper. If any wish to know how we enjoy liberty and how we think of those who have robbed us of our wives, children, and all that is sacred and dear, let them subscribe for the paper. If you would like to give utterance to the dumb by aiding us in proclaiming liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those that are bound, contribute and subscribe for the paper. The terms will be a dollar a year to be paid always in advance. Will those who are interested in the success of our enterprise give us a lift in the start? Will you act as agents and forward to us before the 1st of January next? only make us to feel that we shall be backed up by anti-slavery sympathy and we shall go forward with strength and courage. All letters from the United States must be directed to Detroit, Michigan and those from Canada and England to Sandwich. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. So TJ and Irene, who was Mary Ann Shad Carey and what were her accomplishments in Windsor and why should she also be remembered? So Marianne Shad, uh, when she arrived here, was a single woman in her 20s. Uh, she had been born October 9th, 1823 in Delaware, which was a slave state. And she was born to uh, Abraham Doris Shad and Harriet Shad. And these were free people of color as well, free people of African descent. And 
they were very involved in the Underground Railroad. Uh, their home was an actual way station for people making their way to freedom from the American South. So in, uh, in her childhood, the family decided to move to Pennsylvania primarily for the purpose of ensuring that their kids could have access to education. And so Marianne Shad came with her family to Pennsylvania. She was able to go through school. She very much like Mary Miles Bibb, uh, TJ alluded to the parallels, became a teacher. And she taught in various uh, places in the Northeastern US and she became very involved in the anti-slavery movement. And then in September of 1851, she came to the North American Con uh, Convention of Colored Free Persons that was held at St. Lawrence Hall in Toronto. And there she met up with Henry and Mary Bibb and at their invitation, she decided to move herself as a single woman to Windsor, Canada West, so that she could open up a school um, here in Canada West in, in Windsor. And so she did that right away. Um, a very brave move. Uh, Windsor was not a great place back then. It was, uh, it was described as a very rude and dirty little town. <laughs> but she made her way here. She established a school right inside the refugee reception center, which was basically abandoned military barracks that would be on what's now the grounds of Windsor City Hall Square. And in this very, uh, not very ideal uh, facility with pretty meager resources. She opened up a school. She had 30 something kids uh, reporting to school. She was also teaching uh, adults at night. And you know, the whole time that she was here, she was continuing to engage in her activism, not only about the evils of slavery or assisting um, refugees from slavery as they were then considered, or dealing with white supremacy, although those were very important things, but she was also fighting against misogyny and misogynoir. And that was even fighting against the established black leadership uh, of whom most were men. And uh, she engaged in a bit of a falling out uh, with some of the other leaders in the community because she was so outspoken and decided in 1853 to start pulling together resources and support to establish her own newspaper. So now we've got two newspapers going in Windsor, two black newspapers. We've got the Voice of the Fugitive, which is uh, well established and doing great. And then she forms the Provincial Freeman. And Marianne Shad, uh, not Carrie yet because she wasn't married yet. She initially, when she first published the, the, the uh, Provincial Freeman, um, kind of put up a, a straw man <laughs> and had it appear as though Samuel Ringgold Ward was the was the publisher. But in fact, if you looked just below the masthead, it always said, please send correspondence to Mary A. Shad in Windsor, Canada West. I mean, so that tells you who's actually in charge. And uh, that whole paper was written in her voice primarily and and she really used it to emphasize the idea that self-reliance was the true road to independence. She didn't want to support or promote the idea of people of African descent begging or relying on charity. She very much wanted to show the world that people were doing well once they were able to get here and live in freedom and earn their own resources and profit from their own labors and their skills. And so she highlighted a lot of those stories about how people were being successful here. But she also kind of was pushing against the, the predominant narratives of you know, Victorian era women and the domesticity that was expected of them. And even in the voice of the fugitive, while it was a very powerful instrument for, and, and a voice for black people, Often they would reprint articles about what women's place was and that kind of thing. Marianne Shad was not having it. So she really um, launched this pretty feminist newspaper considering the standards of the time. And she caught all kinds of hell for it. And she was constantly under attack for, you know, not quite exuding the right levels of femininity <laughs> and, and submissiveness. And she did, uh, she did ruffle some feathers for sure. But what she did was pretty remarkable. And she's considered, she's considered the first black woman in Canada to, um, she's considered the first woman in Canada to establish a newspaper and the first black woman in North America to establish a newspaper. But that's questionable because Marianne, sorry, Mary Miles Bibb was doing a lot of the work over at the Voice of the Fugitive prior to that. 
I mean, one other thing that I would add is just that uh, Marianne Shad uh, went on to do a whole lot of other amazing things. We're focused on her writing in Windsor, but she also uh, put out a wonderful booklet called um, A Plea for Emigration, which was designed to lure people or entice people to come and move to Canada West if they wanted to live as free Black people. And, and that included not only formerly enslaved people, but free people of color. There was a lot of debate going on then about should we go to Liberia or to the west coast of Africa? Should we go to Haiti? Should we go to other places? And she was trying to say, no, come to Canada West. You're going to do well here. And here's everything you need to know. This is what the crops are like. This is what the climate's like. This is the lay of the land. And, and this is the place to be. So uh, she did quite a lot. She's a pretty impressive person. But even after she left here, she went on to become a lawyer. She was one of the first women to graduate from Howard Law School. She was a Civil War recruiter. She was a suffragist. I mean, she did a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Irene, you, uh, you, said, you said it all, right? <laughs> you, you said it all. Ancestor Mary Ann Shad, uh, just, a, just a juggernaut, a revolutionary. Like so, like so radical in that time. I've uh, I've been reading like some stories about her as of recently, and one that sticks out to me is uh, this bit that I had read about when she was uh, twenty five, and she she uh, wrote to the North Star, you know, to let folks know that we uh, we need we need less talk and more action, kind of thing. And I'm just like that, you know. When I, when I think about that and I think about her like going back and forth and recruiting for, for the Civil War and just like putting herself in, in places, I'm like that, she is such a revolutionary. Like her activism is, it's, it's what we see today with the circumstances that we have now and also the, uh, the, the ability that we have now. Like we have social media, you know, we have, um, we have, we have big movements that are, working towards like leveraging uh privilege for you know for 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 most people who were like Mary and Jad was like kind of she was kind of like in a in a in a space of her own you know standing out saying too much and then having other revolutionaries who are like you might want to pipe down a little bit you know you might want to pipe down a little bit you're being too radical you know you're going to blow the bubble too big and it's going to pop you know and she's like yeah pop the bubble we need to pop the bubble like that's the problem you know so uh that's i mean marianne chad like like she has that hustling like shad dna in her that just like builds and builds and grows and and, and does things you know and uh if we had like three hours for for the podcast i would love to like 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 start to like pick apart like all of the amazing things that uh that irene had just mentioned about like whether or not she was the uh, the first black woman publisher in North America, that's huge. The uh, first black woman to, uh, to to like to graduate the law degree from from Howard, but but maybe the but maybe the first but maybe the first black woman to graduate a law degree in in America. I don't know if that's that's true or or not, but like these are astounding like these are big these are big accomplishments and like this is this brings it like home into our community you know like sandwich town Bowie wangatanong uh the, the windsor region you know we like we wave our our north buxton flags like really really high and we're like we're, we claim that and we're inspired by it and it's so it's so very important amina over to you i will be reading Marianne Shad excerpt from A Plea for Emigration or Notes of Canada West in its moral, social, and political aspect with suggestions respecting Mexico, West Indies, and Vancouver's Island for the information of colored immigrants. Detroit, G.W. Patterson, 1852. The population of Canada consists of English, Scottish, French, Irish, and Americans and including colors persons numbers about 1,582,000. Of the whites, the French are in the majority, but the increase in immigrants of Irish, Scottish, English, and other Europeans is fast bringing about an equality in points of numbers that will be felt in political circles. In Canada West, the French are in the minority. The disposition of the people generally towards colored immigrants, that is so far as the opinion of old settlers may be taken, and my own observations may be allowed, is as friendly as could be looked for under such circumstances. The Yankees, 
inter-country and interstate adjoining leave no opportunity unimproved to embitter their minds against them. The result is in some sections a contemplative sort of prejudice, which among English is powerless beyond the individual entertaining it, not even affecting his circle. This grows out of the constitution of English society in which people are not obliged to think as others do. There is more independent thought and free expression than among Americans. The affinity between the Yankees and the French is strong, said to grow out of similar intentions with respect to political affairs. And they express most hostility, but it is not of a complexional character only, as that serves as a mark to identify men of a different policy. Leaving out Yankees, having but little practical experience of colored people, they, the French, are predisposed from the influence alluded to, to deal roughly with them. But in the main benevolence and a sense of justice are elements in their character. They are not averse to truth. There's a prevailing hostility to chattel slavery in an honest representation of the colored people. Their aims and progressive character backed by uniform good conduct on their part would be in a very short time destroy every vengeance of prejudice in the province. The public mind literally thirsts for the truth and honest listeners and anxious inquirers will travel many miles, crowd our country cha chapels and remain for hours eagerly and patiently seeking the light. Quote, let the ignorance now prevalent on the subject of slavery be met by fair and full discussion, an open and thorough investigation, and the apathy and prejudice now existing will soon disappear. S.R. Ward. Colored persons have been refused entertainment in taverns, invariably of any of an inferior class, and on some boats distinction is made. But in all cases, it is that kind of distinction that is made between poor foreigners and other passengers on the cars and steamboats of the Northern states. There are the immigrant train and the forward deck in the United States. In Canada, colored persons holding the same re relation to the Canadians are in some cases treated similarly. It is an easy matter to make out a case of prejudice in any country. We naturally look for it and the conduct of many is calculated to cause unpleasant treatment and to make it difficult for well-mannered persons to get comfortable accommodations. There is a medium between servility and presumption that recommends itself to all persons of common sense of whatever rank or complexion. And if colored people would avoid the two extremes, there would be but few cases of prejudice to complain of in Canada. In cases in which tavern keepers and other public characters persist in refusing to entertain them, they can, in common with the traveling public generally, get redress at law. Thank you, Amina. That was wonderful. For TJ and Irene, another question here. How did the two newspapers, The Voice of the Fugitive and The Provincial Freeman, differ from one another? And what did they have in common? You have two papers publishing at the same time. What were they like in contrast to one another? Well, I'll start. I mean, they were both uh, subscription-based, very much uh, dependent on the interest of anti-slavery activists and members of the abolitionist communities in the U.S. Uh, as well as Canada, but mostly the U.S. So they're published here in, in Windsor and Sandwich, but they're very outward looking and they're really designed to amplify the messages of the local communities to people elsewhere in North America to give them a sense of how things are going here and you know what these formerly enslaved people are encountering and how they're faring. And these newspapers were absolutely essential in helping to turn public opinion away from the previously prevailing sense or pervasive sense that people who had been living in slavery couldn't make it on their own and that there was no hope for them that you know they just had to remain in that state in that condition because they could never actually survive on their own without the supervision of you know a, a white patriarchy or whatever and you know they were both very important in terms of telling the actual stories of what was happening on the ground here in Windsor and Sandwich and everyday stories of how many people were arriving and what was happening to them and where they were finding work but they were also advertising black businesses. They were also doing really important work in um, promoting and sharing information about the black self help organizations and mutual aid societies that were being formed and how people were organizing and, and becoming activists. You know, there were so many people who arrived here directly out of slavery in the United States that as soon as they could meet their essential needs, find food, find shelter, find, um, you know, uh, some sort of economic sustenance, work or, or 
um, an opportunity to farm or whatever it might be. The next thing that they wanted to do was to organize to get their kids access to education, to deal with voter rights, to make sure that they were actually receiving everything that was available to them as British subjects. And both uh, newspapers really conveyed that very well. Where there was a bit of difference was that um, Henry and Mary Bibb were very much committed to things like the Refugee Home Society. So they were also very interested in fundraising and they had important work that they needed to do and they were also using their newspaper as an instrument to raise funds for those endeavors. As TJ mentioned earlier, the Refugee Home Society was helping formerly enslaved people who had all kinds of agricultural skills and know-how, know -how, like they were experts in it, but they didn't have an opportunity to own farms and profit from these skills. So the Refugee Home Society was helping them to get deeply discounted land so that they could own their own farms for the first time in their lives. Marianne Shad very much was focused on the idea of self-reliance. She was very much anti-charity um, she accepted some funds from missionary societies to run a school or something like that, but she wanted families and individuals to kind of make it on their own. And so she was very much in opposition to that fundraising component and often spoke out against it. Um, I would say that those are the main uh, differences. TJ, what say you? Uh, I believe they had the same, the same goal, but, you know, our approach to our activism is rooted in the environment and our, our experiences and like where we're trying to go. So if we, if we look at uh, contemporary activism, you know, there's, 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 there's a, there's a group of people who are anti charity, anti establishment and won't, won't do fundraising and believe in more so like group and group, group economics, self-reliance. And then there's, then there's other uh, arms of that, of that activism that are trying to receive, uh, government funding and this sort of thing, you know, and I, and I, I see um, the voice of the fugitive, you know, that was, that was a platform, you know, for, uh, for fundraising for the, uh, the refugee home society, but, but they, they, it, it seemed as though, you know, they were also interested in like, in like this, this government funding and like building community that way. And, uh, and the, uh, and, and Mary, Mary Ann Shad was, was on the other side of it you know like when we think of when we think of activists there's you, you know you have like your leftist and you have like your far leftist and then there's like then there's like anarchy right you know and i wouldn't i wouldn't say that that marianne shad went as far as like into the anarchy side you know but today you know she she definitely would have been on like the the, the front the front lines of the march you know screaming to down with the establishment you know down with the establishment and and used her her education and her and her background and the tools that she had uh that she had developed you know throughout her life you know to do that work and that's like really really inspiring because because i can relate to that you know so much you know uh looking at looking at their stories and how uh mary bib and mary ann shad had this uh had this, 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 these paralleled experiences, but you can see they were, they were coming from different sort of political spaces, different ideologies. And, uh, and that still, that still happens today, right? It still happens today. Uh, Irene, I think, I think you mentioned just about everything that, that was, that that's different between the papers, you know, but I think it also speaks into, into ideology and, and, and their and their activism and what the what their final goal was, you know there was there's 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 one camp that's like really looking toward like the integration and there's one camp that's saying you know we we have to we have to build something ourselves before we start to reach out into the community, you know so I, I I'd say it's kind of like the 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 early uh, Dr King Malcolm X sort of thing you know one camp is you know, we, we need we need, to, we need to come together. We need to we we should we should integrate so we can build community together. And the other side is saying, uh, no, thank you. I don't want to be in partnership with with the oppressor in, in any in any means. And that's it, it's a very important uh, distinction between uh, between you know both of both of these individuals that we're that we're talking about. And uh, maybe many things like 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 changed as these as these as these papers evolved and then eventually disappeared and in, in the way that they went on to their lives. Uh, Marianne Shad uh, 
becoming becoming a, a lawyer and just doing the fantastic activism that that she was involved in uh mary bib going into into entrepreneurship but the uh yeah the, the the papers i think i think the difference between the papers was was just the way that they engaged in their activism and what their ultimate goals were amina schools among the refugees mary bib my school is not as large as it has been during the winter Many have hired out to farmers for the season, yet is now quite large, too large for the room we occupy. I have not yet received a dollar for my labor. I hardly know what is duty in regard to continuing it. I cannot afford to give all my time. A small compensation would satisfy me, but even this has not yet been given. I do not think schools can be kept up here without aid from the states. The public money is almost entirely under the control of the French and they are Catholics. Consequently, nothing can exceed their bitterness to the colored people because they are Protestants. There is so much to be done in the States. It seems inhumane to think they can do much for foreign charities. Yet, this is the work of their hands. They made the fugitive slave law. They are protecting it now. Mary E. Bibb, Anti-Slavery Bugle, April 12, 1851. For Irene and TJ, having already been designated persons of national historical significance, Mary Miles Bibb and Mary Ann Shad Carey are each being shown some extra special love this year. Tell us about these recent developments. Yeah, this really is the, the banner year for the Marys. It's an exciting time to live in Windsor. I mean, just to, to follow up on your, your question, uh, Marianne Shad Carey was designated a person of national historic significance and her federal historic plaque is in Chatham because after she lived in, in Windsor, she, she did live in Chatham and published the paper there. Uh, she's also in the U.S. Women's Hall of Fame and her house in Washington, D.C. is a national historic site. She gets all kinds of love. But later this year in October, a fabulous life-sized bronze monument uh, to her is being unveiled at the University of Windsor downtown campus. And we're so excited about that. It's by the local artist Donna Main. It's uh, commissioned by the University of Windsor. And I just love where they're placing that monument. It's uh, going to be uh, by the Social Work School on Ferry Street at Pitt. And uh, it, that really connects her and her story to both the theme of social justice and to the fact that she was a newspaper woman as that was that building was the, uh, you know, the home of the Windsor Star for many years. So that's happening in October. And that is just so cool. There's also an international symposium that's being uh, organized all around her life on October 2nd out of the University of Delaware and Queens University. And many of us will participate in that. And we're so thrilled. Yeah, Mary, uh, Mary Ann Shad. I don't want to say she gets a great deal of celebration because she needs like so much more celebration for for the work that that she's done. You know, when we look at when we look at the the two Marys that were that were celebrating, you know, one of those Marys has not received, you know, a lot of those a lot of those accolades and that's uh that was that's that's what motivated me to learn, you know, so much more about Mary Bill was because there was so there was so little, you know, everything. I mean, most of what I was able to uncover, you know, thankfully came from uh, Dr. Fua Cooper. And, and uh, I mean, the marvelous research that, that, that she's done. Marianne, Marianne Shad, I think it was, I think it was last year. She was, uh, she was celebrated on, on Google, which was, which was a really, really neat thing to, to see. I also, I also read that she was, uh, she was, she was having her obituary was being, have, has anybody heard about this? Let me see if I can look it up really quick. Yeah. Or, so uh, the, yeah, the New York Times. The New York Times uh, published a uh, her obituary, which is, you know, it's it's like we take we take so long to 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 honor like these these amazing people because the uh, the, the the dominant culture, the powers that be, don't know don't know if they should because what kind of worm that might open up. You know, we we look at uh, the celebrate the the way that. Uh, Mary Bibb has been celebrated at least locally as of as of late, and it brings up all these questions. Like people want to know, you know, like who, not not who is she, but how come we don't know who who she is? You know, there's there's a monument, there's a there's a name that there, there's a park that is being named after her, but inside the community we don't know who this person is, and there's some frustration as to why. We understand why it's because you know, traditionally and culturally, black stories get 
get get shoved under the carpet, right? You know, and now black voices are are being elevated. You know, much the way that the the voice of the fugitive and the uh, the provincial free men were 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 working to to do that work. You know, back in the back in the eighteen fifties, we're seeing that rise of voices happening now. And now dominant culture has to has to reckon with our knowledge of our ancestors and how we want to celebrate them and how we're able to take up space in a meaningful way to to do so. And now, I mean, with 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 all the celebration that uh, that that Marianne Chat has received, now now there's now there's this 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 president to 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 like elevate all of our heroes to that place. You know, like it can be done. It should be done. The research the research needs to be done, and it and it's happening right now. And that's that's really really exciting. But we have so much work to do. You know, because for every Mary Bibb and every Marianne Chat, there's like a hundred thousand other revolutionaries that are going to rise like we're going to start to speak their names we're going to dig up their stories and the dominant culture is going to have to start to make space you know monuments that don't need to be there are going to disappear be replaced with things that like actually bring people together and uh the i mean the legacy of the two marys who we're celebrating today is is important to reflect back on, but I mean, it's like the fire that is like pushing our activism right now. Like we have so much to, to say about them, you know, and it's happening so often, you know, this podcast is happening and I'm sure this won't be the last time that we speak about these two, you know, amazing, you know, revolutionary people who've just like done so much for us. Yeah, it's a funny thing. I mean, um, and TJ was so instrumental in getting that city park named after Mary E. Miles Bibb. So congratulations to TJ and the whole team at the Friends of the Court who advocated for that. There was recently the theft of the federal historic plaque to Henry and Mary Bibb. And while that is very sad and it's you know really reprehensible that that happened and there's a need to replace it as soon as possible. The funny thing is there's never been as much press coverage in this town about the bibs as there was when that plaque got stolen. <laughs> so I do not want to congratulate the thief. That's not where I'm going with this, but but it certainly, um, it, you know, it really uh, shone a light on how little people know about their story, about these stories and how there is a hunger for these stories and, and people do want to find out more about the Marys and others like them. Mary Ann Shad's farewell, August, 1855. In taking leave of our readers at this time, we do so for the best interest of the enterprise and with hope that our absence will be their gain. We want the freemen to prosper and shall labor to that end. When it was not but was said to be needed, we traveled to arouse a sentiment of favor of it and from then until now have worked for it, how well others must say, but through difficulties and opposed obstacles, such as we feel confident few, if any, females have had to contend against in the same business, except a sister who shared our labors for a while. And now, after such a familiar acquaintanceship with difficulties of many shapes, in trying with a few others to keep it alive for one year, as it first promised, we present it in its second year, afresh to the patronage of friends, to truth and justice and its editor, the Reverend W.M.P. Newman, to their kind consideration. To its enemies, we would say be less captious to him than to us, be more considerate if you will. It is fit that you should deport your ugliest to a woman. To colored women, we have a word. We have broken the editorial ice. Whether willing or not for your class in America, so go to editing as many of you as are willing and able and as soon as you may, if you think you are ready. And to those who will not, we say, Help us when we visit you to make Brother Newman's burden lighter by subscribing to the paper, paying for it, and getting your neighbors to do the same. Mary Ann Shad, adieu, Provincial Freeman, August 22nd, 1855. So TJ and Irene, you know so much about both of these women. They're, they're so close to you. How have they influenced your work and your own writing? Well, if I was, if I was to jump in, I'd say probably probably the majority of of my career and in activism Marianne Shad like she lit the flame for like radical activism you know if we reflect on our circumstances right now and our contributions to to the liberation of uh of of, of black people and uh bipoc community if mary if marianne shad is recruiting soldiers for 
civil war, going back and forth into places that are more dangerous than we could, at least that I could ever imagine stepping into. Standing on the platform that she built with her own two hands, you know, and pushing like the liberation of black folks, women, black women, you know, direct action out front, anti-establishment. These, these are, I mean, these are the jewels upon which we build our activism now. And Marianne Shad is not collecting the credit for that. You know, direct action revolutionaries are not looking back at the work that Marianne Shad did, but it's rooted in their bones and in their blood, you know, like it came from somewhere. And that's, uh, and I feel so, I feel so close to that because it, like, like growing up, that's been, it's always been my approach. Like, put your, like, put your body on the line. Like, just be, like, put yourself there. As, as, as far as, like, influencing my, my, my writing, since, since missing, since the Missing from History project, like, my, my career as, as a creative excelled exponentially. You know, like, when I think of where I was in 2015 and where I am now, and that's, like, it's a span of, six years in 2015 i was just starting to understand the work of of mary bibb you know and her connection to sandwich town which and my connection to sandwich town and how important these stories are and then my connection to to my own grandmother and then and then reflecting on the millions of grandmothers and aunties that have just been entirely forgotten about but you know, we're part of that struggle. I think about my oldest known ancestors that came into into Canada. You know, from from Pennsylvania. My uh, my oldest known ancestor is called who was called Richard Travis had passed away. You know, so his 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 wife and their family like taking this taking this this journey into into freedom. And that story is known by that story would be known by nobody but but myself unless I were to to share it. And I'm one of just millions of people who share these same experiences. Like this is this is the blueprint for for our stories. Like they're right here. They're rooted in somebody who was as loud and radical and brilliant as Mary Ann Shad, and somebody who was as strong and forgotten as as Mary Bibb. Like it's 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 so it's so important. And we can uh, like for me personally, I draw everything back to that. Everything. Yeah, and I would add to that just, you know, the way that I was brought up uh, with such a focus on these stories and on our family stories in particular, you know, I was really uh, taught to think that there's no excuse uh, not to excel, you know, given the, the challenges that people faced in that era and how much they did. So full disclosure, Marianne Shad is not just a historical figure to me. She's also family. I'm a descendant of her sister, Elizabeth. And you know, A.D. Shad that runs the length of North Buxton is named after their dad. And, and that's where many of us come from who, who live in this region. And, and what's really exciting uh, for me as a woman who's writing and who's also dealing with, you know, white supremacy and, and fighting against misogyny and all of that stuff is just, you know, the great role models that uh, are extended to us through these, through these stories and these words. And, you know, there is so much there you, that you can directly transfer, you know, transplant directly into this time and kind of modernize the language and realize that in some ways we're still fighting the same struggles and, and that there were people who, you know, had the courage under much more difficult circumstances to struggle against these things and, and so should we. Before we wrap up and say thank you for this, this wonderful insight, um, I mean, I hope you don't mind if I ask you, your poetry comes from your deep journey, your journey yourself that mm -hmm. you and your family have made. Have you found the voices of this region start to seep into your work as well? Oh, most definitely. Um, actually, I think that Windsor was one of the first times where I felt at home since we left, um, we because of the war, we had to go to a few different places and Windsor was one of the last stops and um, I felt the most connected. Um, I remember actually it was in grade 12 when I found out about uh, Marianne Shad and I was obsessed. I read everything I could about her and I just thought it was just absolutely enlightening um, the way in which she went about things. And so for me, I feel the most 
rooted and at home in Windsor, though I know that I've only been here since well, August 1999. But it's the place that feels the most at, like home. And the more I learn about the histories, I, I remember when I, I, it was teacher who introduced me to um, a bib for the first time. I didn't really know of her. And again, I got I, I was enthralled with her as well. The more I learn, I understand they're not my direct ancestors, but there's a there's a connection there where you feel like this is a home, this is a place that that matters. And it's really been a lot in my poetry. Um, the last poem I performed was about discovering snow and discovering Canada, discovering home. And so, yeah, it, I think that I'm very much um, inspired by the space that I'm in. And I find, I don't know if it's because I've come into Windsor, but I find Windsor to be m one of my favorite places to be. I think the the type of people and the, the types of stories that are here will continue to inspire you because you, you figure out that there's layers to everything. You think you know, and then there's like more layers to it. And so most definitely it has... Um, it, it has inspired me, if anything else. TJ Travis, uh, Irene Moore Davis, and Amina Abdul, thank you so very much for sharing your these wonderful stories of these amazing women, the two Marys. And thank you for sharing your connections, and Amina, for the beautiful readings. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.